Good morning, friends. Allow me to welcome you to today's service once more. As we come to the Word of God, I would like that we turn our Bibles, if you have your Bible with you, to the book of First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians, and let us read chapter 2 from verse 1 through 16. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 through 16, although our preaching text will be from verse 13 only. So we do this for context. If you're there, let us read together. I read from the ESV, the rendition of God's word. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain, but though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impunity or any attempt to deceive but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please man, but to please God, who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is our witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you, like nursing mother, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil, we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you, and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things uh, from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets, and drove us out and displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. So as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but the wrath has come upon them at last. Let us commend ourselves to God in prayer. This is your word, O God, which is deep in its truth and meaning. We come to you, therefore, that you may open it up to us. As we do this, Lord, we are thankful that your people here have just now worshipped you in their giving. We thank you for the blessing that that is. We pray that we may put it to good use for the expansion of the kingdom of God. Now, Lord, may you, by your spirit, unction this, your word to us and help us to see the deep truths that are hidden here that we may be edified, and that those who are yet to be saved may come to the knowledge of the truth. 
and that in Christ Jesus they too may be saved. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We know as those who live in this country uh, that nowadays there is a way in which the preaching of God's word is treated. And there are many occasions when people have to add many things to it, hoping that when they add things to the word of God, then they will make it more palatable. The sermons and preachings are heralded, are advertised with things such as come for your miracle. Come for your miracle. It is, it is time for your healing. I do not say, see them saying come for your resurrection. Bring your, the dead to be resurrected. But at least they say come with all those who are sick so that we will heal them. There will be miracles. Of course, when you go and your miracle does not happen, you are told it is because you did not have enough faith. Isn't it? You did not come with enough faith. The blame is on you. Today, we want to focus on verse 13 of 2 Thessalonians, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 that we have read. And I just want to read it again for for us to, to see clearly what the apostle writes there before we uh, attempt with the help of the Spirit uh, to break it up. And we also thank God constantly for this, uh, that when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as uh, what it really is, the word of God which is at work in you believers. That the word of God is at work in the believers. You know that if you remember in Acts and chapter 17, Paul had, after answering the Macedonian uh, call together with Silas, they had gone uh, through Philippi and after that uh, to Thessalonica. And when uh, they were there, we learn uh, that uh, Paul preached the word of God together with his companions. They preached the word of God in the local Jewish synagogue that was there. And for three Sabbaths, Paul reasoned with them of the word of God. He spoke of the Lord Jesus Christ and how the Lord Jesus Christ had been uh, arrested by men, how he had been crucified that he had died and had been buried and that he had risen again. He spoke with them, telling them that this Lord Jesus who had been killed by the Jews was actually the Messiah. That his death had been foretold, that he was the atonement, the sacrifice that God had given for sin. These men did not add many things to the gospel. They preached the gospel as it was. They did not try to flower it, to make it more appealing. They reasoned from the scriptures and the scriptures only. These faithful preachers of the word of God, that is Paul and his companions, they were under attack for their preaching. They were attacked for their preaching. They were they were chased out of Thessalonica. In fact, the gentleman who had housed them, a man called Jason, was beaten up for housing them. For they had brought a teaching that was strange to some people. But we know as we read uh, the scriptures that we had read uh, that uh, there are some people who believed. A few people believed in this gospel and they were saved it must be noted that there was persecution not only on these men verse 6 of chapter 2 that we read is clear uh, that uh, there was persecution and also uh, not only to the apostles to the apostle himself but also uh, to these men but the result of their labors 
is that the Spirit of God enables some people to believe. While others, obviously those who are not elect unto salvation, rejected the word of God. They rejected the gospel. But it is clear as we read what we have read and also as you read Acts 17, that the apostles had very high regard for the scriptures. And so they, they based their preaching on the scriptures, on the word of God alone. And so as we come to this point in verse 13 of chapter 2 of First Thessalonians, the apostle is writing now to affirm these things that they had preached and to affirm that they were in fact genuine preachers. That what they were preaching was the word of God that they had not gone there to antagonize the Thessalonians. And he's also writing to assure these believers that their salvation, the effect of the word of God upon their lives is genuine. Is genuine. So as we come therefore to this uh, part of the scriptures, we can only ask ourselves then, how should we approach the word of God? What is the attitude that we, with which we should approach the word of God? As those of us who preach from the pulpit, how should we approach the word of God? And what about you who sit in the pews? What is the attitude with which you should listen to the word of God? And so I pray that as we go through this text, we will be helped by the very word of God to see what kind of attitudes we should adopt. And so first, the pulpit. The pulpit. We who preach, how should we approach uh, the word of God? And I contend that the pulpit must highly regard the word of God. We must highly regard the word of God and not only highly regard it, we must attribute the fruitfulness of our labors uh, to God. When the message of God has been preached and there is fruit, we must give tribute to God. We must give glory to God. And the reason Paul and his companions, that is uh, Silas, uh, with whom he is writing this letter. The reason why they are thanking God constantly, for you see there he says, we, we also thank God constantly for this, is that the Thessalonians received the word of God which they had uh, from the apostles. And they accepted it as the word of God. The Thessalonians did not accept the word of God as the word of Paul. The word of God that we preach is not the word of the preacher. It is the word of God. It must be accepted as the word of God. When it is faithfully preached, the preacher must focus the minds of those who hear it to God. I told you as I was beginning about how preachings are advertised in our country. And in many parts of this region. It is the man of God who is heralded. The, we are told it is the man of the mighty prophet is coming personally. So come, bring your people. And there are men and women who will say, since it is the mighty prophet of God, I will go. If it was his assistant, I wouldn't go. But the mighty prophet of God. Oh, it is because they do not know that the preached word should be the word of God. That focus should be on God and his word. That glory should be given to God for his word. God has granted that his word be preached to be received by those who are elect unto salvation. Isaiah son of Amos says that when the word of God is preached in chapter 55 verse 10 and 11. He says that when the word of God is sent out. 
it must accomplish what it sent out for. Either it will convict some unto salvation, but to others who reject it, it will be judgment unto damnation. That is the word of God. It is not the word of man. So those of us who preach must have a high regard for it. We come with trembling and fear, knowing that we are handling the word of God. Lloyd John says that a man who preaches is like a man standing between God and sinners. Paul's view of the word of God clearly is that it is what moved the Thessalonians to believe. It is not his eloquence. Paul is not saying that we preached so well before you. That it was our style that made you to believe. The Thessalonians received and accepted the gospel despite opposition. Despite opposition in their context. I have told you that the, the apostles were themselves hounded out of town. They were beaten up and chased away. Under those circumstances, it would have been very hard for people to believe. If the people who have, been, who have brought the message have been chased out of town, what about the people who are remaining behind? They would not believe. In any event, it must be remembered that these people were worshipping idols. They were worshipping idols. So the only way they could have believed would have been that there was power in the word of God. There was power in the word of God. That is the only way they could have believed. We are told that the Thessalonians, they received and accepted the gospel. And so Paul and his companions are thankful. They are thanking God that their preaching was not in vain. That it bore tangible fruit in the heart of the hearers. And that there was real spiritual and moral transformation in the lives of the people to whom they were preaching. And that moved even the hearts of the apostles. Look at verse 8. Look at verse 8. It says, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel, but our very lives. Because you had become dear to us. There was change which we could see. There was change which we could see. I want you to turn back with me for context to Acts and chapter 17. So that you get clearly what we are talking about. Although I had mentioned it in passing, let me read it. Now, when they had passed, I'm reading from verse 1. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews, and Paul went in, and that was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, this Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rubble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities shouting, This man 
who have turned the world upside down. Listen to them. That Paul and his people, they have turned the world upside down. They have come here also. Jason has received them. And they're all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus, and the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. There was persecution. There was persecution. And so, when under those circumstances people believe, Paul can only say, it is God. It is God. That is Paul's view of the word of God. It is God. Because that is the only way to explain that conversion. And they are cognizant that it is the Holy Spirit that has convicted the hearts of men. You remember in Acts chapter 16, how also in a similar manner, the word of God was preached. Acts chapter 16 and verse 14. We remember the story of Lydia and her conversion. In verse 14, we see one who heard us was a woman. Luke is writing, reporting on what was happening. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Tatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of who? Of God. She already was worshipping God. But had not known the way of salvation. She had not known the way of Christ. What happens? The Lord opened her, her heart. To pay attention. To what was said by. By Paul. The pulpit must have. A high regard for the word of God. And when there is fruitfulness, we attribute it to God. Not to GBC Kisumu. Not to our way of preaching. Not to how biblical we are. We attribute it to God. We cannot take any credit for any fruit born by the message of the gospel. And fundamental to our preaching must be this great conviction that what we speak as preachers is not our own message but the message of God. Not our own message but the message of God. And every genuine believer in Christ must be humble. Since their salvation is wrought into their lives by God. By God. Not by some mighty prophet of God. By God. But secondly. What is the view? What is the attitude that you as the people who sit in the pews should have as you approach the word of God? Look at that text again. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God. The word of God. The pew. The hearers, the congregation who sit to listen, must humbly receive this word of God and accept it as a faithful message of God, that it is the very word of God. 
you must be convinced in your heart that this is the word of God. This is the word of God. And so that you must humbly come to listen to the word of God. If you were to focus on the vessel that brings the word of God, you may miss out on what is being preached. Because you are, you are regarding the container and not the message. You are focusing on, on, on the vessel that, that brings the word of God and not the message. Because although Paul and Silas and his companions were mere men, clearly they had been approved by God to bring his word. That is what we see in verse 4. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please man, but to please who? God. Because it is God who tests our hearts. It is God who tests the heart of men. They became God's mouthpieces, proclaiming the gospel of Christ. Throughout history, God has been pleased that his word would be preached through human beings. That is the ordained way in the word of God. God has always been pleased that his word would be preached by mere human beings. Sinners like you and I are the ones who are supposed to preach this gospel. And for this reason, and on the basis of this reason alone, hearers of the word of God must receive and accept the message of such faithful preachers, faithful servants of Christ, as the very word of God. So Paul is thanking God for enabling his hearers to add to, to, to accept that what was being preached was the word of God. You see, it is God through his spirit that enabled Lydia's heart to be opened that she may realize that right here is the word of God being preached to me. This is Christ being brought to me. As you sit in the pew, you must Come with expectant hearts, knowing that you are going to listen to the word of God. And then humbly accept it, not as the word of a man, not as my word, but as the word of God. As the word of God. In Acts 17, we also read of the Bereans, don't we? When the word of God was preached to the Bereans, what did they do? They went and searched in the scriptures, isn't it? To see if what Paul was preaching, what was, it, was what was in the scriptures. They wanted to confirm that this truly is the word of God. So that then they can accept it. Is that your attitude? That the only question you would have as the word of God is preached is to the question to ascertain that it has been preached correctly. By going back to that very word of God, which providentially now all of us have. And checking if what is being preached is from inside of the word of God. That should be the only question in your mind. Have they preached it correctly? Is this what is contained in the word of God? That is the attitude of the person in the pew. Have they preached it as it is written? Have they added things to it that are not there? Have they removed some things that should have been there?
Turn with me to 1 Corinthians and chapter 1 and verse 18. First Corinthians and chapter 1 and verse 18. Split backwards. For the word of the cross is folly. In some versions it will say foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved it is the power of God. It is the power of God for those who are being saved. Turn again backwards to Romans. Flip backwards to Romans and chapter 1. Romans and chapter 1 and verse 16. Paul speaking says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. To the Greek. As you sit at the pew, your attitude Towards the faithful preaching of God's word matters. It matters. It matters. We must acknowledge and receive it with all eagerness. Every time it is proclaimed in our hearing by faithful servants of Christ, we must come expectantly. Not only are we to receive it, but we must accept it. We must accept it. And the appropriate way to accept the word of God is to obey it. That is the appropriate way to deal with it. Is to obey it. To obey God's word is to obey God himself. As we sit listening to God's word being preached, Friends, do we realize the tremendous presence of God's word with us? Do we realize that? Do we realize that in preaching the word of God and as it is undertaken, as the preaching of the word of God goes on, do we realize, friends, that at that very hour, God by his spirit has literally come down to speak to your heart. He has come down to teach you, to train you, to correct you, to rebuke you, to mold you into Christ-likeness. He has come down to speak to your heart, you who is saved, that you may be edified. God has come down to speak to those who are not saved that they too may come unto salvation. Do you realize that that is what happens when the word of God is being preached? That God has minded you. He has condescended. He has come that he may call you to himself. That the Christian may be encouraged. That the non-believer may be woken up from slumber, from death in sin, unto life. Oh, friends, when we come to the word of God, let us take it for what it truly is. The word of God, not the word of man. If we take this word as the word of man, it will not be beneficial to us. We will not benefit. If we consider the preacher only and not the content of his message, we are lost. We are lost. 
Do we thank God that his spirit has helped us to receive his word as the word of God? You who has been saved like the apostle Paul and his friends, do you ever sit back to thank God for enabling the spirit of God to help you to realize that what you're hearing is actually the word of God? To differentiate it from mere words of men. Many are lost in our day and age because they have not been given the grace to differentiate. The grace to discern the truth of the word of God from mere words of men. Or do we thank, do we think that our receiving and acceptance of this word of God is because of any inheritability on our own part? So that we start thinking that we are better off because we are saved and that we, we must be just a little sharper than those who have not been saved. Oh no, we should come humbly knowing that we are coming to listen to the word of God. And that it is God's spirit which is enabling us. And that is why Paul is saying, and we also thank God constantly. We do not thank ourselves. We do not thank you. We thank God constantly for this. That when you receive the word of God, which you had from us, you accepted it. Not as the word of men, but what it really is. The word of God. The word of God. But thirdly, we see from this text that there is power in the word of God. There is power in the word of God. That the, the power of the word of God is still being experienced by these believers. These true believers who have been converted. They are still experiencing the power of the word of God. And the only way that they are going to continue is they must continue partaking of this word of God. Because look how Paul puts it. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received, which was in the past, the word of God, which you heard from us, which was in the past, you accepted it, which was in the past, not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work. A new believers. In other words, it is working now. You received it then, but it is working. It worked when you received it, but it is continuing to work. The only inference we can draw is that these men are continuing to partake of the word of God. They are continuing in it. This is an ongoing transformation. The word of God is at work. God is sanctifying through his word. In that same first Thessalonians chapter 5, just flip ahead and see the prayer of Paul as he winds down his letter almost by way of benediction. And we read this every day as we do our benediction in this church. It says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Friends, even after salvation, it is God who sanctifies. The word of God is what saves. It is what it has power to save. But it also has power to continue to sanctify the believer. Word of God. And the apostle is attributing that visible change that they can see in the lives of the converts to the power of the word of God that they had. 
that they received, that they welcomed. We see that they, they heard, they accepted. These people turned away from the worship of idols. They turned away from the worship of idols. And decided to follow Christ. And that, as we have said, amid much affliction. It surely must be that the power of God was at work. These past weeks, Pastor Tony has been taking us through Philippians. And we saw how in chapter 1, verse 6, we just stand there. Turn to Philippians and chapter 1 and verse 6. Where the apostle is, is it's, it's another prayer and thanksgiving. But he's saying, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. The word of God has power to begin the work of salvation in our lives. And it has power to continue to sanctify us even unto the day of Christ. The word of God. And even if it is amid much affliction, amid much difficulties that we may experience here and now on our earth, it is still able to bring to completion the work of salvation in our lives. The word of God. It is efficacious. It is good. It is enough. It is sufficient. And it is effective. When it is properly preached and properly accepted as the word of God, with the help of the spirit of God, it is efficacious. God is actively at work in the lives of of believers. Philippians 2.13 says that he is the one who is, who is working in our, in our hearts to, to will and even to do his way. He works in us. The word of God continues to bear fruit if we continue to partake of it. And we, we must realize, friends, that, that we are saved and the, trans the, the, the transformative power that we experience in our lives is the power of the word of God. It is that power in the word of God itself. The word of God is, is worked by the spirit of God. Hence its power to transform lives. There are many whose lives have been transformed and those who knew them before can hardly believe that they are the same people. Can hardly believe that they are the same people. They themselves look and reflect upon their own lives retrospectively and they can barely believe that they are the same people. Why? Because of the power of the word of God. When we welcome the word of God with obedient faith, the power of God is at work. But we must believe and continue to believe. So not only is the word of God necessary for salvation, the word of God is necessary, uh, uh, necessary for progressive sanctification. Believers must therefore continue to receive it and to rely on it, to receive it, and to, no wonder, 
we are told in the word of god that we should not forsake the fellowship of believers because Amos was talking here in the morning about those means of grace prayer fellowship reading of god's word Believer, do you desire spiritual transformation? The word of God. But you who is yet to believe, oh, we can only point you to the word of God. We can only preach to you what Paul and Silas preached to the Thessalonians. Jesus Christ and him crucified. Dead, buried, resurrected. A perfect and accepted sacrifice before God. In him and in him alone is salvation. He says himself, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father except by me. No one. He is not a way. He is the way. He is the way. He is not just one of the many ways. There are people who will cheat you that you know we worship the same God. No, he is the way. The only one. If you are amongst us and you are not saved, turn to Christ Jesus. He is the way to salvation. You are a sinner. And you must be saved to see the kingdom of God. You are a sinner and the wrath of God is upon you. Except you be saved by Christ, then you will see the kingdom of God. That is the only way to escape the wrath of God. Because that is the word of God. This word of God that Paul preached to the Thessalonians. And if you have believed, continue to be sanctified through the word of God. Not any other thing. Read the word of God. Do not forsake the fellowship of the believers. Pray. Pray to God. Oh, that we would ask the Holy Spirit to apply these things to our lives. That they may transform us. They may change us. And they may make us more and more like those that Christ would have us be.